continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And today, as I did a few months ago, I would like so much to reprise, at least in tone and intellectual conviction, a well-remembered conversation I had at this table a little over a quarter century ago. Its theme as that of several other Open Mind programs in the late 20th century was religion and social activism which Jesuit father John Lafarge, editor of Catholicism's America magazine, had discussed with me here on Open Mind, and as had Protestant ministers William Sloan Coffin and Martin Luther King Jr., among others. But on November 22, 1987, my guest here was the late Marshall Meyer, the distinguished rabbi who then presided over New York's ancient Ashkenazic synagogue, Congregation B'nai Jeshurun, where I should note my wife worshiped then and does now, and where spiritual leadership is shared now by today's open mind guest, Rabbi J. Rolando Madelon, brought there to the pulpit by his great teacher, mentor, and friend, Marshall Meyer. Now, some thought Marshall Meyer too radical, perhaps preoccupied to distraction with concern for the poor, the dispossessed, the others of the world around us. And I asked him quite directly those many years ago whether this constant commingling of social activism and religion might be a divisive factor. His reply was quite compelling. He said, I can see where those individuals who consider the church or the synagogue, in my case, to be what they require of a Valium. They would like to come on Friday night or a Saturday morning and hear a very, very anodyne, mellifluous, saccharine service of the same nature, the same taste. I don't believe that that's what a service is about, said the rabbi. I believe that there are moments of jubilee, jubilation, elation. There are moments of celebration. There are moments of meditation. But the basic thrust of the surface must be to find in one's own life the presence of God and to translate that presence into action. And I think I stand on very solid grounds on that, Dick, because if we had to make this division between politics and religion, then we would have to quote the words of the magnificent Abraham Joshua Heschel, who is probably the greatest thinker of 20th century Judaism, we'd have to take out the biggest politician of all, and that's God, who would then have no place in the Bible because he is constantly interested in the poor, in the freedom of men and women, in the widow, in the defenseless, in freeing the oppressed. After all, concluded Rabbi Meyer, we Jews were slaves under Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. We Jews come from slaves. This is the thrust of prophetic Judaism. It can be divisive, and if it is, it should be. Now, when last time I asked today's guest how much he agrees with our late friend, he replied, our late friend was also my beloved teacher. He spoke eloquently, and this is why I became a rabbi. 
So I stand firm in that conviction, which is not always easy to implement. But this is what I believe, what people of faith, religious people, are called to do. And when I then asked Rabbi Madelon whether these beliefs also led to disagreement with his own congregation today, he essentially replied, not really, just here and there. And I, of course, would ask him now, just where here and there mostly are. Is that fair? Very fair. Where are they? So uh, we have a very large congregation. Um, I think we are known, we have acquired a reputation because of Marshall's uh, work in the new beginning of our congregation. By the way, our congregation was founded in 1825. We've been around for a long time. But Marshall restarted the congregation after a very, very difficult period in the 70s and early 80s. In 1985 he came and he brought the congregation back to vibrancy. I was privileged to be part of that resurgence together with him. And uh, under his leadership and my partnership with him, and then with the addition of my colleagues after his passing, Rabbi Bronstein and Rabbi Saul, we have acquired a reputation of an activist congregation. We believe in spiritual activism. We believe that we are required, that we are expected, that there is an expectation that comes from God, wherever God is, to, uh, for us to stand up and to do the best we can to fix this world. And so we have acquired a uh, reputation of an activist congregation. We're a large congregation. Of course, not everybody agrees with everything as one would expect. However, it is remarkable that on most social issues of our time, there is a great deal of consensus in our congregation. We have a great deal of consensus about most issues in America. Of course, I said here and there because we are large and it cannot be expected that everybody will be in agreement. Where there is a little bit more of a disagreement and sometimes a little bit more tension uh, is on the issue of Israel. You know, there are two major concerns about Israel. One is the concern for Israel's security and safety. And uh, to some people there is uh, always some sort of a threat to Israel's existence, very existence. We should not dismiss those concerns. Uh, another concern is the concern that Israel might be able to raise uh, itself to, to fulfill its aspirations and its dreams, which uh, have been stated in its Declaration of Independence and which have their roots a very long time ago in our sacred writings in the Torah and in the prophets, the vision that uh, Israel will be a place of justice and peace and equality and morality where Jewish values, where the, 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 the great Jewish values that have inspired a uh, great part of humanity as well, uh, that we have shared through Christianity and through Islam, uh, these great values will be the engine that uh, move this society, this Israeli society, this country forward to fulfill its, uh, its, its aspiration and its dream. So you have these two concerns, the concern for security as well as the concern for the, for the aspirational vision, might we call it. Now, of course, we have to be concerned for both and we have to do, be concerned for both at the same time. Now, there are some people that when the accent is placed uh, on the aspirational vision, they say, how come you are abandoning Israel's uh, security? When we put the accent on security, some people come and say, how come you're abandoning uh, the aspirational vision? Now, uh, w my colleagues and I have the tendency, because we know that uh, m most uh, of the Jewish community the organized, established Jewish community uh, is very firmly uh, 
uh, concerned and uh, actively um, defending Israel's not only right to exist, but also right to security, which is important. We know that the community uh, cares for that. There are some of us that uh, need to be uh, reminding ourselves and reminding the community about this other concern, which is often sacrificed for the sake of security. So sometimes we, as we emphasize the aspirational vision, there are those who come to remind us that indeed we can't abandon security. And so to quote uh, Leon Wieseltier, he has a wonderful quote in an article in the New Republic, uh, maybe a few years ago. He says, the centrifuges are spinning in Iran and settlements are being built on the West Bank. He says we should be concerned about the centrifuges in Iran as if there were no settlements in the West Bank, and we should be concerned about the settlements in the West Bank as if there were no centrifuges in Iran. And I believe that is the position that we should embrace. Now, as I said before, knowing that there are a great many people and, uh, and uh, a great many institutions, uh, great institutions of organized American Jewry who are uh, veiling and defending uh, uh, Israel's security, some of us need to be uh, reminding ourselves and reminding Israel, reminding world Jewry that we need not, we must not abandon Israel's aspirations, which I believe Israel doesn't, but sometimes it gets caught in the, in the issues of security. And so that's where Sometimes the disagreements occur, the tensions occur. I think uh, there's a great deal of consensus in uh, our congregation that um, uh, everybody wants Israel to be secure and for there to be peace. I think there's no uh, fight about uh, that, uh, uh, about those principles. Those are the aspirations. Um, and you say there, uh, they are common to the congregation. What happens to you in your role as spiritual leader uh, when you feel that a point must be made on one side or the other? Life doesn't go in such a way that we're always saying on the one hand and on the other or in point, terms of point A and in terms of point B. Right. What's your relationship with the congregation? Well, I've, have, I've been in this congregation for now 27 years. So uh, there's a very long uh, history and trajectory. And uh, besides uh, discussing these issues, which I don't discuss as a politician, I discuss these issues as a religious leader and informed uh, by my understanding of the sources of our tradition. Well, I don't I do this as a politician. What, what does that mean, I don't do this as a politician? I don't engage in politics. For example, if we talk about the issue that we were just discussing about uh, Israel, for example. I, I'm not an expert in, in borders and, uh, you know, how many refugees, uh, how many, where the borders should go. I mean, I'm not, uh, that's not my expertise. And uh, that's not also my interest. Uh, there are people who will resolve this conflict and sit down and talk about maps and talk about uh, all sorts of issues that have to be discussed. My interest is, as I said at the, in the opening, uh, that uh, I believe there's an expectation. The expectation from God is that we will sit uh, with those with whom we disagree and we will solve our issues peacefully and respectfully, that we will see the other person uh, as a human being in the image of God. That's why I'm saying as speaking as a religious leader, as a spiritual leader. This is what our traditions command us, to see the other, not as a, a lesser, not as a, uh, some sort of a, a demonic force in the world, but as somebody created in the image of God who has the same uh, uh, right to, to life 
and to dignity and to freedom as I have. And uh, that uh, our conflicts have to be resolved on that basis and on the basis of morality and on the basis of justice. So um, that's, I believe, what our traditions come to remind us. And this is what religious leaders are supposed to put before our uh, uh, followers and our congregants is to remind us all the time. It's, of course, it's, it's, it's much easier. The, the other path is much easier. That of the that, politician? That, that, no, that of uh, not resolving the conflict and that of war and that of permanent conflict. It, it's, the, it, it's much more difficult to uphold these principles, to see the other, in, as I was explaining. And so we have to, because it's more difficult, we have to keep reminding and working and uh, 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 making the effort to, uh, to bring ourselves, to put ourselves on that path. And so um, I speak this language um, informed, what does it mean informed by the, uh, the tradition? I understand the texts of our tradition, I've studied them, I've studied our history. I understand uh, as best I can what are the essential values of, of our tradition and I do my best to try to, uh, to mediate them to my congregation, to explain them, to search together about what this could possibly mean in more complicated situations uh, and this is this is part of my work. Now, um, I've been there for, for a long time. I, I don't, as I said, I don't only speak about these things, I also teach about other things. We pray together, we serve together, we study together. I uh, uh, attend to people who are uh, sick and also to, to mourners and, and so on and so forth. There's a, my work uh, is encountering the members of my congregation all sorts of different situations and that's where the, the, the bonds between uh, the spiritual leaders and the congregants is forged. Uh, and so over these years, uh, you know, I've had the occasion to, to be with people and uh, happy occasions to celebrate and I've been with people in, in difficult and sad occasions and, and, and we have a bond. So when I speak about these issues, I don't I don't speak in the vacuum, I speak in the context of, of a relationship. And sometimes people disagree, but the disagreements most of the time, hopefully, are within the context of a relationship. Again, Roly, if I, if I may, uh, I'm not a troublemaker, you know that. But I can't help because others, after we did our last program, referred back to what was happening uh, in December 2012 when the New York Times, which I don't think was making trouble or trying to make trouble, had stories um, relating to uh, your synagogue uh, cheering UN Palestine vote tests its members. Congregation B'nai Jeshurun, a large synagogue on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, is known for its charismatic rabbis, its energetic and highly musical worship, and its liberal stances on social issues. But on Friday, when its rabbis and lay leaders sent out an email enthusiastically supporting the vote by the UN to upgrade Palestine to a non-member observer state, the statement was more than even some of its famously liberal congregants could stomach. And then it quotes, some of your congregants who took great exception to it. How was that resolved? So first of all, it was a, um, a statement that intended to uh, indicate uh, or to express the, uh, the wish that this vote that took place in the UN on November 29th of last year, uh, um, uh, the, the wish that it would be a good step forward, that once the Palestinians received uh, such recognition from an overwhelming uh, majority of the UN members, uh, received a sense of recognition and dignity, that uh, 
this would move the peace process forward uh, in in a uh, in a faster way, in a better way, in a in a firmer way. Um, the that expression um, uh, was uh, uh, not properly captured in a, uh, uh, an email that was sent to the congregation. Uh, uh, the thoughts that uh, we shared were drafted uh, by someone. Uh, it, it did not exactly capture exactly the nuances that we were looking at. This is a very delicate issue. And, uh, the email went out on a Friday afternoon without proper uh, uh, editing and proper checking. There was some miscommunication, internal miscommunication, and a number of people were offended uh, by the uh, celebratory tone of this message. Um, uh, I do believe that uh, something positive can come out of can come out of this. The, my colleagues as well believe that something positive can come out. It's not necessarily a bad thing that uh, the uh, Palestinians receive such recognition. And we were hoping that this would move the efforts of the diplomacy efforts in a positive direction. Uh, some people, as you said, took exception with uh, the language. Some people took exception with the, uh, uh, the mistakes that were made in sending this email. when. It was known that a number of mistakes had been made, and uh, uh, there was some discontent over a period of time. And we had a number of uh, conversations with congregants and dialogues, and and uh, we had to move past this issue. Um, uh, we've all learned from this, uh, and uh, we uh, one of the very positive outcomes of this is that um, uh, not only that we created uh, systems so that such uh, mistakes would uh, not recur. In dealing uh, with the outside world. No, in dealing with the internal mistakes that were made in sending this communication. Uh, so there were a number of protocols that were put into place to make sure that everything works the way it should work. Um, but we've also uh, had to uh, uh, clarify our positions and we had to establish a mechanism by which uh, people who disagree with any position that the rabbis take and uh, we didn't take this position on behalf of the congregation we took it on behalf of ourselves um, but that was not clear in the email and so uh, people say you know don't, don't speak for me you know speak for yourself so we have to uh, number one, be careful that when we speak, we should speak for ourselves. Uh, we don't represent anybody but ourselves. Uh, and that when people disagree with positions that we might take, uh, to which people are entitled to disagree, and we're entitled to our positions, people are entitled to disagree, that we might have uh, some form of a, uh, a dialogue and constructive dialogue and, uh, and, uh, and engage with one another, uh, acknowledging that our community, our congregation is not monolithic and that uh, there is a spiritual leadership that has uh, ideas and thoughts and that there is a, uh, a large congregation where not everybody uh, is in agreement with this position or that position. That differentiation between spiritual leadership and the congregation at large, is that something that one would have found uh, expressed a half century ago, a century ago, two centuries ago, when the congregation was established? Well, I think that there is a great variety of, um, of uh, congregational dynamics between the spiritual leaders and the, and, and the members of the congregation. You have uh, congregations where the, uh, the membership, represented by their board of directors or board of trustees, Christian and, and the Jewish congregations uh, equally, uh, would uh, empower the spiritual leader to to say certain things and and then certain other things could not be uh, uh, said there's a great many examples of of uh, such a congregational arrangement and then there are uh, examples of spiritual leaders 
who spoke their mind, uh, regardless of what their members of the congregations uh, thought. And in many cases, uh, rabbis or preachers or pastors who have found themselves in the situation of having to leave their congregations because of disagreement. There was one very famous uh, rabbi in the early 20th century who was a rabbi at our congregation for just a, a short period for a few years who founded his own congregation in order to be able to speak his mind freely. He call, he, his name was Rabbi Stephen Wise. He was a luminary of the reform movement in the early 20th century and he founded his congregation called the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue. And it, the Free Synagogue is that he would have the freedom of the pulpit. Now many places, many congregations um, uh, have in their bylaws uh, the principle of freedom of the pulpit and uh, it, in many cases it becomes just some sort of theoretical uh, freedom of the pulpit where the rabbi or the pastor is not allowed to, to, to be really, to speak uh, his free, freely his or her mind. And so most places I think are somewhere in between in some sort of a uh, back and forth and some sort of creative tension. And uh, that's not necessarily bad. And Rabbi Madelon, at this point, neither of us has the freedom to go on because the program is over and I'm, I'm so told sorry, our time is up. <laughs> but thank you Thank you so for much. having me. Thank you for joining me thank today, you. Rabbi Madelon. Thank you. And thanks too to you in the audience. I hope you'll join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other Open Mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash Open Mind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.